Yes. Hello. Hello. Is that Hello. Ter is, is Hi, that everyone. Hello, Hello, Terry. Good to see you. Well, yeah, we we we've got some. We haven't got many people with us today. Um, we I'll, I'll hang on a minute and see. We had a, a flurry of people joining us. We've got people from all over, and some people know quite a lot about the subject and do a lot of hard work for our mutual causes. Um, I think, as I was saying to Terry, as I was saying to, we exchanged emails with Felix, so I understand is your assistant. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Very, very hard working man. Um, yes. And anyway, as I said to him, um, because of the timing, because we've had to have a shift and and various other things, um, and certainly no reflection on you, we were not expecting lots of people. We've got another person coming aboard. Um, so we'll keep going informally for a minute. I am recording this, which I hope comes out OK. And if that does, I will send links around and also put a link from our website that we have in york and if you haven't seen that that's the one advertisement you're going to get do have a look at um yorkeuropean.uk and share it among all your friends um we're quite proud of it in york it's it was set up uh, about 18 months ago rather slowly as a um i suppose we're with we this is a theme that will come up i think we're a little bit afraid that our friends in Europe um, and some of us here have great experience of, uh, of Europe and have more than a drop of European blood in us. Um, we're rather afraid that all of Europe might only read the Daily Mail and think we're all a load of budding fascists. And uh, <laughs> one of the purposes of getting you aboard is to hopefully hear you say that you don't all think we are. <laughs> But there, there is quite a strong movement going on to, to counter it. Absolutely. I mean, I'm fully aware and I think most people, well, in, in the EU that I speak with are fully aware of that as well. So don't worry about that. Anyway, we are, that's great. So as I was saying, we are recording it. If at the end of today you feel it didn't quite go as you wanted and you want to say, don't, don't, don't show it, I won't be offended at all. So you said totally in your hands, I wouldn't want to embarrass you at all. Here's another hardworking friend of ours who's a, who's a human rights worker, as it happens. Um, good afternoon, Patricia. Okay, I'll wait another minute, if that's all right with you, sir. Absolutely. I mean, I have one hour now. I just came out of the, um, the well, actually the second now EU-UK delegation meeting, um, where we had a little bit of an update of how the negotiations are going and um, about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I'm super happy to also wait for more people to arrive. We've got two more here, so it seems that's what we're going to be doing. Um, Oh, we're more or less quarrel now in a funny sort of way. I don't feel embarrassed now. <laughs> just for those who are arriving, I just repeat. Um, I, I've got the ability to mute and unmute everybody, as you'll know. Um, as there's not scores of us, I'm quite happy um, for people to um, remain unmute, unmuted unless they've got a noisy dog or partner um, or, or even child, bless them. Um, but uh, we, we'll keep it informal as if we're sitting in a village hall somewhere. And when we come to the question bits a bit later on, I think rather than if we can, would rather than electronics, I just think a raising of the hand and we'll just do it informally as if uh, we're sitting on a stage. It saves everybody clicking and my experience is it's quicker that way and a little bit more human. I think one of the sadnesses of uh, such a long spell like this that so many of us have had these sort of talks where it doesn't really matter whether you're alive or dead as far as the rest of people are concerned, but if you slumped in the village hall, people would notice. Okay, I think we'll make a start. People can, I'll let people in as they go. I hope I don't get too distracted. Um, I think rather than me um, pick on various biographies 
of Terry Rank, uh, who I have studied. I think it'd be better if she introduced herself to us, um, not least how to properly pronounce her second name, which you must get used to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be very honest, I'm super fine with people uh, pronouncing my, my, my surname uh, as you like, um, but I would say it's Reintke, um, so it's a lot of hard German um, consonants, so I get it that it's a little bit hard to, to say. Um, and I'm a, a, an MEP, a member of the European Parliament. Uh, I come from the beautiful city of Gelsenkirchen, um, mm. which is not far, by the way, from uh, Münster. Yeah, which yeah, I think is actually the partner city of uh, of York. So um, I'm from close to your um, your German counterpart, and I have been working in the European Parliament uh, on a various uh, on various topics in the past um, on human rights, democracy, rule of law, social issues as well, and uh, obviously also a lot uh, followed the Brexit negotiations. Um, and I must say, really heartbroken still um, that the UK has left the European Union um, but I'm really really delighted that there are so many really engaged and active people in the UK um, who keep up this pro-European citizens movement that has been built in the course of, of the Brexit negotiations so uh, I'm really happy to be here with you today. Right. We're very free for you to take the floor. Well, I, ha I have some questions on some, some other things, but if you'd like to sum up, summarize the, the various, I know at least three or four facets of your busy life. Uh, and if you'd like to tell us all your work, um, it, you know, we'd be very interested in not, you know, you as a person as well, because I do know you wave various flags at various times. And if you'd like to give us a brief synopsis of each of those, even if they're not terribly relevant to Brexit, we'd be very happy to hear it. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I just don't want to talk too much about myself because obviously um, I guess uh, you might also have a lot of questions about what we do here in the European Parliament. Um, but indeed, uh, I have uh, been working and you can see this here in the, in the background uh, on LGBTI rights a lot. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the LGBTI intergroup uh, in the European Parliament um, and also with that uh, linked uh, on feminist issues. Um, right now I am uh, working uh, in especially in the fight against gender-based violence and um, which i think is a very very important and crucial topic um, as you probably know uh, we currently have the ongoing discussion around um, the implementation well the first the uh, ratification and then the implementation of the istanbul convention which is an international european convention against violence against women so that is something uh, that is very close to my heart um, I have been working on uh, rule of law and democracy uh, a little bit broader as well. Um, as you probably know, uh, inside of the European Union, there is uh, an ongoing debate around um, the safeguarding of rule of law um, with regards to, for example, the independence of the judiciary in countries such as Poland and Hungary. And um, so that is also something that um, I'm very, very uh, concerned about. And that's why I'm trying to uh, work on that as much as possible. And then lastly, maybe to mention, um, because I think uh, that has maybe not been so much in the uh, in the focus uh, of the past years, um, but I'm also a member of the EMPL committee, so the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs in the European Parliament. And um, as some of you might know, I come from a region in Germany um, that is maybe not the richest uh, and that certainly has a lot of challenges when it comes to unemployment, when it comes to poverty. So for me, it has always also been very important to um, build a European Union that is social and that is fighting for justice. Um, because we know that freedom of movement is a wonderful um, achievement. It's a great right for EU citizens to have. But I have always also um, fight, uh, uh, fought for actually creating it in a way um, that it is socially just for everyone, um, that it's inclusive, and that it's uh, strengthening uh, workers' and citizens' rights. Um, so I think this also goes a little bit beyond um, the debate um, that we have had around Brexit. And maybe, uh, if I may, uh, reflecting a little bit on the situation that we have with Brexit, because I just came out of the of the delegation meeting, um, and I think it's very important, obviously, to look at how the 
well, how the situation is in general, how the current negotiations uh, are going. And I think one of the things that um, to me has become very, very clear yet again is that um, Brexit is absolutely not done. So I think these claims um, that the UK government is trying to put out and um, that, you know, the, the topic is solved uh, and everything is fine now and everything is going well. Um, that is, according to my observation, absolutely not true. We have just had an update uh, on obviously the situation in Northern Ireland, which I think uh, is very concerning, especially with the latest threats of actually hold, holding the customs checks um, between um, uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, but I think also beyond that, I mean, if we look at the withdrawal agreement uh, and the TCA, we can clearly see that, uh, that, that there are a lot of issues that are just not finally covered, that are not completely um, uh, negotiated. One of the issues that was brought up again and again in the meeting is the question of foreign and security policy and how the UK and the EU can continue to cooperate on that and also formalize uh, this cooperation. I think this is something that a lot of colleagues in the European Parliament are still very concerned about, especially now when you look at the situation, for example, um, in Ukraine um, and also other places in the world. Um, so I, I don't think that the world has necessarily become a safer place. So it's important that we have a, a common uh, vision how um, we want to act in foreign and security policy. But I would say, and I think that this is always important for me to kind of reflect on when I speak about Brexit, because I've just spoken about um, the various issues that I work on. I think that really the de debate around Brexit goes beyond just what is now in the withdrawal agreement and uh, in the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, because I'm actually sure that a lot of the narratives and the, the story having an anti-European spin, um, but I think they were very often um, actually related to very authoritarian um, narratives uh, in our societies. Uh, and I believe it's part of a broader backlash um, on certain rights, on certain concepts uh, like rule of law and democracy, um, like for example, this very strong uh, anti-immigration narrative, this anti-freedom of movement uh, narrative, um, also attacking the rights uh, of citizens uh, in certain respects. And um, so I think it's always important to see the broader picture and to see how Brexit uh, and anti-European narratives have also tried to attack rule of law and democracy uh, as a whole. And lastly, what I wanted to say, and that's obviously because I know that you are all a very, very engaged people uh, in the pro-European citizens movement in the UK, um, that I'm still very, very convinced that uh, despite Brexit and despite all the difficulties, um, that the need for cooperation um, that we have between the UK and the EU is now actually bigger than it has ever been. Um, because I think I mean, I can tell you from like my own experience since our UK colleagues are gone and we don't have them here in the European Parliament anymore. Um, a lot of things have become more difficult um, to organize. A lot of dialogues that maybe we have had before are not so easily done anymore. So I think it's very important um, as you are doing and I think a lot of other groups across the UK, but also uh, in, inside of the European Union and um, to keep the conversation going and um, obviously to try to also rebuild um, bridges that might have been burned or at least been damaged uh, over the past years. And this is obviously why I wanted to thank you for being engaged. Um, and I can only encourage you to continue to, to be engaged and to work on this. Thank you. Would you like some questions now? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, but, and again, if, feel free, if you want to go off on a tangent and give an extended answer to any question, um, feel free. Eh? We, we, we're in a very relaxed atmosphere, and as I say, among friends. Um, has anybody got a question? They can just raise their hand. It's probably simple. Just remember, as far as my computer goes, is when you start speaking, you, um, you become large on the screen. So that's fine when you're actually contributing. Um, anybody, I can unmute you here. Anybody want to raise their hand? Me. Go on, me. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much, Terry. Um, I'm, I'm deeply depressed that we left the European Union, needless to say. 
Um, and without being rude, I'm looking around at us all, and we're all a bit on the on the older side, if you like. Yeah. Um, dare I suggest that we're a bit unusual in that respect? And, and is it your observation that really young people are much more pro-European than um, the general UK population? I mean, I'm not going to say the majority who voted for Brexit, because the majority actually didn't vote for Brexit. About a third voted for Brexit and about a third voted Remain and about a third didn't vote at all. So it gets me extremely cross when people say that the majority voted for Brexit. But I mean, I'd, I'd like your thoughts on, on the, the age thing, if I may. Terry? Ah, I thought you might want to collect, um, but I'm also... No, we'll do it one by one because I've got a short-term memory, so we'll do one by <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, then I don't need to make notes. No, um, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I would actually agree with that observation. Um, also, I mean, as some of you um, might probably know, um, I have also been really engaged or uh, in contact as much as this pandemic allowed it to. Um, with a lot of groups from across the UK. And I think that um, there are a lot of young people who are really active in the movement. Um, and I think also, if you look at the numbers, yes, I know that the turnout amongst young people was not that high uh, in the referendum, but you could also very clearly see that young people in a very, very large majority voted to remain in, inside of the European Union, um, probably also because for them and their lives, um, there were so many uh, opportunities and rights that are now just lost with Brexit. And I think that this is something that, um, especially now, uh, when I'm, you know, also the work that we are doing in the delegation, in the friendship group, with the different platforms that we have, to always try to remind people um, that, especially young people, are losing so much um, because of Brexit, and that we have to try our utmost uh, to counterbalance that somehow. And today in the meeting that we had, I was raising the point around the Erasmus program. Um, I mean, for me, this is still one of the most avoidable bad decision that was taken um, by the UK government in these negotiations uh, to not be part of the Erasmus program anymore. And I can only suspect that actually there is there is a hidden agenda behind it because they always say it's about the money, it's about the money. But I think it is also about actually not giving the chance to uh, um, to you know be part of exchanges to get to know um, other European um, youngsters um, uh, across uh, across the UK. Um, and for me now trying to really find ways, despite the fact that the UK is not part of the Erasmus program anymore, to try to say, but what kind of cooperation can we still keep going? And I think the touring program, I mean, yes, the UK government is saying that it's replacing Erasmus. I think if I look at how, what, what I have seen, it is not really replacing Erasmus. It is a one-sided program, which is good. I'm not going to criticize that. Um, but the point for me about Erasmus was always this idea of exchange. So you would have people going out um, via, obviously, um, the higher education programs there in the Erasmus program, but also school exchanges, also youth organizations that were supported. Um, but you would also always have people coming in. And I think that this idea of actually having this reciprocal kind of exchange, that is a very, very crucial part of the Erasmus program. Um, and this is, I think, what we also have to fight now that we keep it, um, at least to a certain extent, because in the Erasmus program, um, as many of you probably know, there is also a possibility um, for member states to actually uh, finance cooperation even with countries that are not part of the program. And I'm now trying in Germany, and I think also colleagues are trying in other EU member states um, to actually use this money um, so that there can still be some form of cooperation um, between um, educational institutions, between youth organizations, and so on and so on in the UK um, and in the EU. Because I still think, uh, and I'm going to end by that, um, the Erasmus program really is one of the greatest <laughs> programs um, that could really kind of give life to the idea behind the whole European project, you know? For me, uh, I had the chance to study in Edinburgh for one year because of the Erasmus program, which I just 
couldn't have done without the program because I just wouldn't have had the money to do that. Um, I was studying in Berlin, Edinburgh was much, much more expensive than Berlin, um, let alone a lot of universities. I mean, I wouldn't have had to pay tuition fees in Edinburgh, but a lot of universities uh, in the UK uh, ask for tuition fees. Um, so that wouldn't have been possible for me. Um, and I think for a lot of other people as well. And I think these experiences, they really make a very strong fundament for people and to have this European spirit and to understand what this European project is about. And this is why I hope, I still have this hope at some point, and then also the UK will become part of the Erasmus program again. Because especially if we look into the future and if we look at how to rebuild these bridges that I was talking about, I think for people to have these experiences um, is absolutely crucial and can then be a basis also for future cooperation. Yes, I, I, I personally think that your suspicions about um, the, the, the uh, Erasmus programme and why it was turned down, I think they're sound because uh, the sons of the rich, and I use the word sons advisedly, can always go to any university anywhere, so it doesn't affect the, uh, the people we are uh, probably opposing. Right, I see Sally has a hand up. You'll have to unmute yourself. I can unmute you, Sally. Uh, oh, I'll have to unmute. Go ahead, Sally. You need to unmute yourself, I think. I, I think Magdalena was before me. I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you carry on. Magdalena definitely gets a shout. As you're on, it will be quicker. Okay. I just went down the list the other way. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, uh, Terry, I, I, you know, I really agree with what you say about Brexit being part of this broader authoritarian trend. Um, and it seems that, you know, right, right across um, Europe, including UK, you know, one aspect of that is this backlash against feminism. And, you know, in like in, in Hungary and Poland, there's this talk of like countering gender ideology. And, um, you know, this is quite sort of quite strong. And, and uh, you know, with um, like Orban and his demographic conference and, <clears throat> you know, this sort of mix of like, sexism and racism you know we want less migration and more white babies please women stay home and produce white babies and we're starting to see it now with um right-wing commentators in this country we're starting to see in places like spectator and telegraph you know basically headlines saying something like you know more white babies please so you know i, I think um you know i think uh, a number of women in, in the Remain movement, you know, we did try, you know, we did a number of things where we were talking about how sort of, in a way, how macho a project Bre Brexit was, you know, and trying to sort of talk about the impacts on women. Um, and so I just wonder whether, you know, that's kind of a bit of a background to think, you know, is there, is there some way that sort of European feminists are sort of trying to sort of cooperate against this? And I wonder if that's one way in which you know, even though we're outside the EU, whether sort of feminists in the UK could be part of part of that. And that could be, in a way, one of our roads, one of our many pathways back. Um, you know, I think just after the um, just after the Brexit vote, I think Anthony Barnett said, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of a long road back to Europe, you know, and I, I just wonder whether this could be one of the pathways that could feed into our road back. Yeah. Um. Absolutely. And uh, maybe just to, to um, make one point about what you said, it's a, mat a, macho, a macho project and um, Brexit. My wonderful colleague, uh, Molly Scott Cato, who is still also very active in the European movement in the UK, actually now, um, well, former colleague now, because of, uh, she unfortunately had to leave. She made this um, website. It was a project where um, they had something, I think it was called the Bad Boys of Brexit. And they were showing how a lot of very rich men, because it was only men, were actually profiting from the deregulation um, that would come with Brexit and how they were trying to basically use it to make more money. And also beforehand had very, uh, very much supported um, the Leave campaign. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. And I think it's definitely an angle that we should look at, both from the side of how did it get there? How, you know, how was this movement built uh, against your membership? Who was behind it but i think also as you rightly point out um how we can turn this debate around um because i definitely think you know i 
I think I, I probably wouldn't be in politics without a feminist uh, solidarity. I mean, I obviously consider myself a very committed and passionate feminist. Um, and uh, without these strong networks that I have had um, with women, with feminist organizations and so on, um, I would have never become a member of the European Parliament. So for me, um, having this uh, also as part of a, a political project um, to, as I said, like rebuild the cooperation, work together. Um, and I think obviously on Brexit related issues, but I, I also think beyond that, I was just mentioning the Istanbul Convention and this uh, convention against um, gender-based violence or violence against women. And this is not a convention of the European Union. It's a convention of the Council of Europe um, that the UK obviously is still part of. Um, so I think that that could, for example, be one, be one topic um, that we could rally around, because I think the issues that are mentioned in the Istanbul Convention, they are very, very relevant across Europe, um, also in the UK, but also in Germany. Like we now, um, we still have so many problems, for example, uh, with the financing of women's shelters. We still have so many problems with um, actually, even in our penal code um, to have, um, uh, proper definitions of rape, to have proper definitions of what sexual harassment is, and then to, to take the steps against that. Um, so I think if we identify topics like this and then work together across Europe and really build a movement that goes beyond borders, then um, we can yeah, not only win these debates inside of our countries, but we can also have this really European counter movement to this authoritarian backlash that we are facing. And maybe just lastly, to reflect on that, um, I think obviously the situation in Hungary and Poland is the most horrible. I mean, maybe you have heard recently we had the third case of a woman dying after being de and denied a life-saving abortion in Poland after this, um, well, de facto absolute ban on abortion that they have introduced. Um, but I think we can also see it everywhere else, basically. I mean, in Euro, in, in Germany now, we have a far right um, party sitting in the national parliament, the AFD, which is so openly anti-feminist, which is so openly anti-fundamental rights. Um, and I think that in order also there to counter that, we have to work together cross border and we try to have to build a movement against that. Because ironically, even though these people are nationalists, they have actually managed to build a pretty powerful European network, as you were mentioning, this demographic conference, uh, the World Conference of Families um, that has already been organized a, a couple of times, where you can really see that, you know, Christian fundamentalist groups, far right groups across Europe are working together um, to destabilize a consensus around uh, women's rights, a consensus around fundamental rights. Um, so I think the best thing to do for us is uh, really to counterbalance that, to also build a very strong European feminist movement. Thank you very much. Magdalena, sorry I leapt over you. Please speak. You're, I can't hear you, Magdalena. Uh, um, uh, no, I've unmuted myself. Hi, okay, Terry. By the way, I, I went to school near to Gelsenkirchen, so I know the area very well. Um, I, um, Where did you go? I went to Dorsten, St. Ursula, I did my abitur there. Oh my God, I have so many friends who went there. It was actually one of the schools that I was thinking about going to, but then I went to the Afford Yes, so, yes, I lived there for eight years, so I, ah, I, no, I did my abitur. But I was born in Hungary, and I'm going to Hungary to help in the elections at the beginning of April. I joined the Green Party there uh, because I got a Hungarian passport uh, three months ago. And so I'm, I'm a dual citizen and I'm joining there. But uh, that's not what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I was also at the Council of Europe uh, at the British delegation when, the, uh, uh, when Britain had the chairmanship and when the um, Istanbul Convention was there. And I was also at the... Um, wonderful conference which Angelina Jolie attended in London, which was the conference against uh, violence um, against women in, in, in conflict. Um, so I'm, I'm very much interested in what's, you know, the continuation of it. Um, but what I originally wanted to ask was that we are having big discussions within our Remain movement, even within the European movement as well, about what our best approach should be 
how can we achieve um, rejoin? Uh, some people don't even want to hear the word rejoin. They're talking about, yes, uh, single market, customs union, um, uh, it will put off people and so forth, and uh, it will take a very long time. So it's a, do it step by step. There are lots and lots of different uh, disagreements about it. I am a rejoiner personally. I proudly wear my European badge wherever I am, day and night, and I am European. Um, nobody, you know, they can't take me out of Europe because I am European, it's in my blood. And um, so, um, what do you think can we do uh, to, to stay close enough and uh, to, to, do you think we are, the people who say, no, we can't um, talk about rejoin, let's talk about the single market and the customs union, let's try and do it that way. What, in your opinion, is a better approach for the UK now? Um, thank you so much. And um, now I find this really uh, super nice that uh, actually you went to school so close to, to where I grew up. Um, the question obviously uh, is very, very hard to answer because I, I can see the arguments on both sides. I can see that, you know, you need to have a very strong vision. And, you know, even if you know that you are not going to rejoin in the next five years, still having this like long term vision and aim and goal also being very outspoken there. Um, I think that this is something um, that I see a lot of reason for. And I also think that, um, especially inside of the movement, um, to, to come together and to rally around that um, is absolutely crucial. However, I think um, that in the strategy, even if you have that as the vision of what you want to do, um, I think you can also sort of make like maybe like create or talk about milestones or steps on the way to get there. And I think that there are indeed certain things um, that you can ask for that might not mean that you would immediately rejoin the European Union, but that you actually say, okay, this is a very concrete problem that we have due to the fact that we are not member in the single market anymore or in the customs union. Or, I mean, if you look at a lot of issues, um, I think that you can basically always make the argument that because we are not part of the Erasmus program. Young people do not have the same opportunities and the same possibilities. So this would be a very concrete first step to take um, in order to move closer again. Because, I mean, I don't know how you feel. I'm also very interested in hearing the different views here. Um, but I think that these kind of milestones or steps will be needed in order then to create a bigger momentum to actually get um, the, the rejoin movement um, across the line. So uh, for me, having this as like, not in terms of that's our final aim, but saying we would like to take this step and this step, and this is the strategy how we get there. Um, I think I also see the reasons and the logic behind that. Um, but I think that for me, obviously, what would also be very interesting to know is what we from the side of the European Parliament can do to facilitate that. Because I think that there is a conversation to be had inside of the Remain movement, inside of the big pro-European citizens movement in the UK. But obviously, because we are now starting with the work in the delegation, we still have the contacts from the friendship group. And um, so for me, it would be interesting to know if you say um, either rejoin or you know steps on the way um, what could be our role in this as MEPs? Because despite the fact that we are obviously on the paper um, not your parliamentary representatives anymore, because well, I guess you are still Magdalena, but most of you are not EU citizens anymore. Um, I still think that there are really, really a lot of MEPs here in the European Parliament um, who feel very strongly about the situation in the UK and who still want to do everything they can um, to well, facilitate the co cooperation with the UK, but also to work very closely with the pro-European citizens groups uh, and to see um, how we can get closer again and what we can do to help you uh, in the efforts that you are making, how we can engage with you. I have a lot of colleagues who say that they would love to go to the UK um, and also meet with citizens um, to try to make uh, your voices heard also in the Future of Europe conference, uh, issues like this. So 
if you have concrete ideas, examples, what we could do from the side of the European Parliament, either you know, in this rejoin narrative or in more concrete, maybe smaller steps, I'd be super interested to know. So I, firstly, I personally found that very comforting. Thank you. You don't know how valuable those words are to us sometimes when we despair, Terry. And my question really was going to be, and I'll get it out of the way, is if one day we had a, a government that was honest and represented the people and was vaguely democratic, um, is there still a will within Europe? We haven't pissed you all off yet totally. And I think the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No, I mean, you, need, you, you, you need to answer that. I think you have. We've got plenty of questions, so let's move on in fairness to other people. Heather Watts, please. Heather, you need to um, unmute yourself. I'm trying. There we go. Thank go on. You. Um, hello, Terry, and uh, thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, in terms of these incremental steps that you mentioned, um, in the wake of Brexit, lots of us who were and still are heartbroken about the situation now, there was a great deal of discussion, certainly amongst the local campaign groups, about the possibility of European associate citizenship. Now, you might think that that's a bit pie in the sky or is a bit naive, um, but a lot of us were writing to Giefer Hofstadt at the time, um, and letters were always replied to. And at one stage, we thought it might be in the frame. Can you tell me, has that just completely disappeared? Um, I don't think we ever got to a stage where we thought that it was even possible. Um, and we understand the complexities of actually a scheme as such as that. But it's, it's still in my mind that if it was possible, I think there would be quite a large uptake on it. And I think everybody would say they are willing to pay and probably pay handsomely. <laughs> we'll do anything. Careful, rob a bank. <laughs> so, <laughs> so could you give could you give me an idea um, just how if 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 that has um, gone by the by uh, gone by the wayside or if that could be a possibility? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think that, I mean, there was also here in the European Parliament uh, a very uh, lively debate around that topic. Uh, and I think we came um, in the end to the to the kind of legal conclusion. It was not so much a political question. It was more a legal question and mm -hmm. um, that in order to make that possible, we would need treaty change. And as you know, treaty change in the European <laughs> Union is something that is not so easy to do because we need unanimity. Um, but, and this is maybe the good news, um, uh, that now, as I mentioned, we have this ongoing conference on the future of Europe. And one of the issues that will be discussed there is indeed the question of EU citizenship. Um, because, I mean, Brexit has raised a lot of questions with regards to EU citizenship, but also a lot of other issues that come up um, in you know, everyday life of people um, actually raises question about what EU citizenship really is. Um, is it something in its own right or is it linked to a national citizenship, which if you read the treaties, that's where it comes from. But then how do you deal with it when this nationality is not part of the European Union anymore. So I think there are a lot of legal and political questions around EU citizenships that uh, EU citizenship um, that really should be addressed. And I would always hope that inside of the conference on the future of Europe, you could actually make these voices of uh, UK citizens who have lost their EU citizenship heard and then bring up also ideas like, for example, um, this associate citizenship, how it could look like, because the idea of the Conference on the Future of Europe is that from the citizens panels that are being organized on a variety of issues. So they speak about climate change, about rule of law, about democracy, about women's rights, about everything, and also EU citizenship. And um, from that to come up with ideas of 
obviously legislative proposals, but also potentially treaty change. Um, and then I think the hope is that because there was this big effort of really getting the citizens involved in how the future of the European Union can look like, then also to have a stronger momentum with the member states to actually implement these treaty changes and then to find unanimity um, inside, of the, inside of the Council. I would say, if you ask me from a political point of view, um, what Magdalena just mentioned about the uh, upcoming elections in Hungary will play a very crucial role in this because, as you know, especially the Hungarian and Polish government have been really blocking any kind of progressive changes if they could. So basically, they are keeping everybody else hostage on this and they always say we are going to veto any progressive changes. But if there was to be, and it's not completely impossible, but if there was to be a change in government in Hungary, for example, if also in Poland, then there could actually be a momentum, I believe, that we could get treaty change. And I cannot promise or guarantee you right now that also something like an EU associate citizenship would be part of that. But at least there is a window of opportunity there. Thank you. I suppose my, my only slight fear is if we did have um, associated citizenship that people like me paid 200 pounds for um, and if it had any advantages like travel or whatever it would it would create a two-tier system in this country where some people would not have 200 pounds to get the, the same freedoms that i have which sort of doesn't sit right so i'm sure you you people have thought about all that but it's it's quite a complicated issue isn't it Okay, we've got uh, Chris Hammond, uh, please. Unmute yes. yourself and speak. <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm actually speaking from Würzburg or near Würzburg in oh, northern Bavaria. So, uh, Grüß Gott, Terry. Um, I've also got friends, this is just the personal bit. Um, I've also got friends who live in Laufersweiler. And that's in the Hunsrück. And they tell me that the house next door to them is uh, a brother, a sister, or something of yours, or an aunt or an uncle, something like that. Can you confirm that, first of all? I have got questions. Oh, maybe it's my cousin. I have a cousin who lives in that area. That's but it. she doesn't have the same surname that I have. OK. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, uh, it's Sabina Falked. And, uh, Sorry, we, we need to identify people who aren't here. I think that's fair enough. No, okay. Can you get on with your question, please, Chris, because we've yes, got quite course. a lot of people. OK, sorry. Right. Well, the main question is, um, if the present bills that are going through Parliament at the moment, uh, which are all uh, diminishing and dismantling our democracy, if those all go through, will that have, uh, will it make it more difficult for Britain to rejoin. Uh, the bills in case, are, are you aware of them, Terry? Yeah, okay. Uh, and you mentioned Conference for the Future of Europe. If everyone here ought to be aware that the European movement are putting that a talk on this, uh, this evening about the conference. Uh, if, if you're not aware of it, please do Please do search it in the web. Uh, emails have gone out. Um, another question to Terry. You mentioned that MEPs might be willing to come to Britain. Here in East, well, there in East Kent, uh, Canterbury, we are enlivening our group. And one of the thoughts we've already had is to link up with uh, West Flanders, uh, the north of France, and of course, uh, Kent. So those, and therefore, what, what route, what channel do we have? Surprisingly, Kent has still got an office in Brussels, um, which is a sort of a hangover from the past, because it okay. used to be one region. Okay, Thanks, so Chris. Go for it, Terry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe I start by saying I have a very, very big family because um, my parents both come from very Catholic families, so they had a lot of children, so I have a lot of cousins and uh, I don't always have the overview who is living where, sorry about that. And um, regarding any kind of divergence, and this really applies to potentially, well, most or 
all legislation that can be passed if it means that the UK further diverges from EU legislation um, in whatever field. Um, obviously, that is going to make it more difficult um, to rejoin the European Union because, as you know, in order to join the European Union, you need to have the full application of the acquis, which means all the EU laws and rules um, would need to be applied. I would, however, say, and just to put it in perspective, I mean, usually countries join the European Union that have never applied the acquis and that have never built their laws on the basis of functioning EU law. So I would still say that as the situation stands, and maybe in some fields there will be divergent, but I think in a lot of fields it's also not going to be so substantial that the process of rejoining is going to be impossible or so, so, so difficult that it would drag on for many, many years. But if there was a political commitment also to say, um, obviously, um, when you join the European Union, you have to apply the acquis, um, then I think it can, can be done. Some things probably would have to be changed, um, but that is just the, the way of how uh, accession to the European Union works. And now I just want sorry from my side because I studied in Edinburgh, but beforehand I actually um, lived in, in Kent for a while. I went to school for half a year in Westgate on Sea which is close to Margate and also not too far away from Canterbury. So actually I know, I know the region a little bit. And I would say um, that obviously you can use the official links, the regional links, the, but also the, the, the city uh, partnerships, for example, that still exist. I think we should really try to re revive um, these kind of possibilities to create exchange. And then obviously, um, because I'm always trying also to encourage my colleagues, um, if you would like to invite MEPs, if you would like somebody to come over for a talk, you know, if the pandemic actually allows, um, then I'd also be super happy to create contacts there. Um, and I'm also planning to come to the UK finally, uh, hopefully in April. You know, I was supposed to come in November, but then they asked me to uh, negotiate the coalition agreement for the German government. And then I had to cancel the whole trip, which really was uh, uh, very, very sad for me. But um, I hope in April it's going to work. Thank you. Stephen, would you, um, we've only got 10 minutes left, so a uh, chance to get your last question. Great, flagged okay. up. Stephen, you go ahead. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Terry. It's wonderful to, to, to listen to you and to, uh, to think of um, what we had before um, and, to, and how sorry we are that we're not there. Um, I was actually going to ask you about European citizenship, but I think that's been covered. You know, the, there was a particular link between York and the whole concept of European citizenship insofar that it, the, the, the Terry, Tony Venables and ECAS was supported by a foundation here in York to uh, actually write about European citizenship. But I really wanted to focus on, you know, the hope in a sense that I felt coming through what you were saying about the Erasmus scheme. And I was really, really disappointed that there wasn't a much stronger campaign in the UK about that. And uh, Howell Kerry Jones, who was the European, uh, uh, he was, you know, one of, one of the commissioners, um, was so concerned because he had been so involved in 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 setting up Erasmus and here in York you know we we lost the possibility of the gypsy and traveler community the young people actually engaging in a, an exchange with uh, other Roma communities in, in through the European Solidarity Fund so that is a huge huge loss I think for us and I just wondered in terms of you giving some sense of hope there you know, what would the campaign need to be in the UK to try and change that? And, and, and also in, in, in Brussels as well. Um, because I was, I was really disappointed that there wasn't a stronger fight about Erasmus. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how we, you know, wh whether there's any hope in getting that back again. Um, because I think there would be some key players here in the UK who would be interested in that. Um, and it may be others on, on this call know more about it but i i certainly have felt that there's been a lack of any real campaign about that terry um no i think you're absolutely right um and stephen if you were to ask me and referring a little bit to magdalena's question what would be the first kind of step that i would see on the way 
would exactly be to do a big campaign to rejoin the Erasmus program. Um, and I think that there are so many very good arguments um, why, I mean, the Turing program, and it, the Turing program can even stay, you know, nobody has anything against the Turing program. Um, just it's not, it's not replacing the Erasmus program because it cannot in the scope that it has. Um, and I think that um, a campaign like this where you say, look, maybe the question of rejoin, there is a lot of disagreement, the question of single market, customs union, but can we not agree and get a majority behind that we have lost so much by not being part of the Erasmus program anymore? And really also make this a cross-party campaign, not to say, um, you know, this is something that the Greens are asking for, the Labour Party or whoever, um, but really to try to find people from universities, from different organizations, civil society actors, maybe even some celebrities who have had experiences with Erasmus, tell their personal stories. Because in my experience, you know, a lot of people tell me, okay, Terry, how can you make the EU tangible in people's lives? For me, the strongest the strongest story to tell there is still your own personal story and that very often is related to the Erasmus program. So an exchange that you have had, uh, uh, yeah, obviously having a, a university a year somewhere, an Erasmus year somewhere, but also so many other things. Um, and I think with this, this could be a first step where we say, okay, you know, on the way mistakes have been made, um, let's just try not to just give up on this, but really try to reinstate the opportunities that were lost uh, and become part of the Erasmus Plus program again. So if you ask me, I would say um, that would be the most powerful kind of first step um, that you could take. Thank you, Terry. I am promised to Felix to let you free at the top of the hour. So I will keep that promise, which gives us eight more minutes. We've got Tamsin standing in the wings. If someone else wants to flag up for maybe a final question, please do. But otherwise, in the meantime, Tamsin, please speak. Thank you. Um, Stephen, just to mention uh, Erasmus Plus, you just brought that up. So um, I am involved with Erasmus Plus Alliance, uh, working with um, Andrew Hadley, the Centre of International Learning and Leadership, and also Jennifer Monaghan and many others. We're a voluntary organisation and, and I put uh, the link to our website at the moment. Uh, we are trying to work cross party to, um, as Dominic Grieve says, to try and encourage it, that's a, well, there's there's low hanging fruit with Erasmus, and uh, you know we we are doing our best and working with the YEM as well, the Young European Movement. So it's not it's not all, all in the dark. There are things there are things happening. Most at the moment, uh, the, the website is a resource, um, but things are moving. So you know, keep keep an eye on our website. I, I'll um, interrupt you there. Do send your an introductory paragraph and your link to York for Europe, and I'll put it on our website as well, please. I will do, I will do, thanks, thank you. Um, but Terry, um, I did want to uh, talk to you about um, Festival of Europe because I'm a director of Festival of Europe, and um, the festival is um, a programme of events, a summer of Europe um, from May to September, and it's really about encouraging uh, good relationships and sort of harmony post-Brexit and building up, uh, building cultural bridges is our strap line. I'll put the website link in our chat. Um, and um, we have um, Howard Goodall, who uh, CBE, who is yep. one of our patrons. And we're also working with the United Strings of Europe who are touring. And we have grassroots organizations all around the country. And I encourage any of you, all of you here, some of you already getting involved. Chris Hammond is involved with us. Um, and uh, we would love to connect more with our continental uh, counterparts, you know, and this year it may be more UK based. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, we're working with Scotland as well. We've got Euro walks, exploring links with Europe. So this is our step by step approach back to Europe. We are non political, but obviously we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Brexit. Um, so we really are in, in looking for projects that really um, you know, strike a chord in terms of linking uh, the, the, the beneficial things of being close. And the fact that we are geographically European, whether we like it or not, that is just a fact, you know. Um, so, you know, we really want to celebrate our relationship with Europe. And we'd love to have you as an ambassador. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> Kerry, answer all no. that. So there you go. <laughs> it sounds absolutely fantastic and do get in touch and then um, we will try to see uh, everything that we can do and also um, obviously if I can support or if somebody uh, else from the parliament can support, uh, I'm super happy to um, to be in touch and then to figure that out. Brilliant. And as you might know, my my birthday is actually on the day of Europe on the 9th of May. So oh, oh, gosh, some people nice. say you know it was meant to be that I that I'm so European in my heart. Okay, let's move you on because I did promise. Martin, you've got three minutes to ask a question and have it answered to give um uh, time to say farewell properly. So go. I can do that. So Terry, you um, said before that um, you'd be interested in knowing in what ways MEPs in the European Parliament might actually support us in our campaign to rejoin. Um, when you ask that question, um, the immediate thought is, I'm sure there are millions of things, but I can't think of one now. Um, when I do think of the millions, how do, what is the best place to direct that kind of request for support? Because there are no organizational links in place now that, that grassroots people like us can use to make contact with people in the European Union, other than the goodwill of people like you who have very kindly turned up today. So thank you for that. So the question is, where, how do we, what's the best way for us to connect with the European Parliament, or the European organizations, if we want to get involved in a discussion about how you can support us? Um, I mean, we have formed this friendship group, um, the EU-UK friendship group, which is a number of MEPs from all member states of the European Union and that still would like to keep in touch. Um, so I'm one of the co-chairs, so you can always contact me. But obviously also now we have the delegation. So this is a more institutionalized way. Um, so you can always, as grassroots, as civil society actors, from whatever background you come, um, get in contact with them. Um, and also lobby for if there are certain things, for example, in the imp implementation of the withdrawal agreement or the TCA that from your point of view are not working, or political things that we should address, debates we should have in the European Parliament, for example, about the Erasmus program, about whatever you think is politically relevant. Um, so I think that there you, you can always get in touch and really as much as possible still try to use the European Parliament also as your parliament obviously um, because as i said for most people you know we still feel that um the european parliament also belongs to you so um do do get in touch and use these links and um, the more informal and also the more formal and i just wanted to make one point because catherine wrote it in the chat i absolutely agree that erasmus is not only for higher education and academics and we have just actually allocated in the new budget much more money to have more people in vocational training to have apprentices um, profit from this program because it's absolutely crucial that it's not only, really not only an academic program. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Jerry. That was, that was an excellent, I'm sorry to a couple of people who've since bobbed up. I'm, I am gonna keep my word, we've got two minutes. Um, thank you very much um, for everybody who's contributed and especially, obviously, um, to, uh, Terry, who metaphorically must have quite damp shoulders in many respects, but it's so nice to see somebody out there. Um, do please, Terry, tell Felix, who I feel I'm getting to know through all our little emails, um, to keep following on from your reply, do tell him to any changes or any new names or addresses or features, send them to me, us, and it will go on our website. And we do have quite a broad readership, strangely, quite a lot in China, but that's not whom we write for. Um, but we do have people, and we share things, the European movement groups do, as you probably know, we're quite good at sharing things around the country. So feel free to use our site as we use it, a village pump for just raising flags for various things. So it's um, one minute away. So I'll formally thank everybody who joined us. It's not the best time or the best month to do it, but thank you. Uh, the questions, I had a load written here in case everybody dried up. I haven't used one of them. Um, you've covered them all. And thank you so much, Terry. And it's been lovely to get to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. And um, yes, the best way to contact is to actually write an email. I'm sorry if we haven't replied to some emails, um, but I, I will check that. And um, 
keep up the really, really good work. Um, we are all still following very closely what is happening in the UK. And I know that the times right now may not look uh, as the best um, that we have seen, but uh, I'm sure that we can turn this around. And, um, you know, I said in my last speech before Brexit in the European Parliament, I will see um, MEPs from the UK being re-elected to the European Parliament, and I'm still sure of it. So um, oh. let's do this. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just Thanks. to check, Thanks, Terry. I, Terry, I will try and put the link to this online. You're still happy for us to share this because it might get a much wider readership. That's very kind. Of thank course, you, everybody. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Over and out. Bye. See you all in Bye. Brussels. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 See you in Brussels.